listening to diasporic music on Black Power 96 in we the station is in is in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, not Russia, and we are in uh, Toronto, Canada, and we're getting ready to speak to Dr. Gerald Horn, the uh, African uh, historian who holds the Jean Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. And he is uh, riding high with, he has about 30, 40 books out, but his latest book is Armed Struggle, Panthers and Communists, Black Nationalists and Liberals in uh, Southern California uh, through the 60s and 70s. And uh, Dr. Horn, how are you doing today? Oh, it's all good. What about you all? Well, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm doing good. I made it to another Sunday, so it's always a good week. Right on. I guess the first question. So, I, I, no, let, let 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 Linda Melinda lead off. Go ahead. Yeah, no, like um, we're kind of behind. Do you want to touch base about the the research that you're doing with Sierra Leone? Well, you, well, I'm considering it. Uh, I, I might have said that I was in London doing research recently on my book due next year on slavery in Washington, D.C. And therein, I stumbled upon the Declaration of Independence of Liberia, penned circa 1847-1848. It's, it's quite a militant document, uh, given the roots of the folks who penned it in Liberia, West Africa, their roots being in Maryland, North Carolina, Virginia, etc., it's one of the most militant documents of pen by anybody from that cohort during that time. And so prior to reading this Declaration of Independence, I, I had a very stereotyped view of Liberia uh, as a sort of neo-colonial appendage. And of course, Sierra Leone has a similar vintage, that is to say, original settlers, many of whom sided with the British during the 1776 secession from the British Empire that led to the United States of America, and then wound up in Sierra Leone. Uh, and then after Sierra Leone was established and the British turned against the slave trade, when the British Royal Navy captured slaving ships on the high seas, they would take the Africans, be they from Angola, Congo, uh, what is now Mozambique, wherever, and drop them off in Sierra Leone. And so Sierra Leone has a very heterogeneous population of African descent. So I've been considering exploring this topic of these so-called uh, black settler states in West Africa. Although with any project like this, you need a, an angle of entry. I mean, I, I need a, a, a hypothesis, which I have not come up with yet. But since I have the mic, let, let me segue, if you don't mind, into... Oh, Gerald, the, be, be, before, you, before you do that, could I ask you a question about, you know, Carlos Cook's... Well, first of all, do I have your permission? Of course. Uh, Carlos Cook's called... Uh, Amer black black Americans in the South, Barbados, and uh, uh, the uh, Barbados American blacks in the South, and uh, the Liberians, uh, uh, the greatest Uncle Toms in, in, in the world. That's 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 in his writings. He was very critical of of of, of, of Africans who came from the United States, Barba Barbados, went to. Uh, uh, Liberia, and he referred to to them very negatively in, in his book. Well, I understand that, but on the other hand, I'm sure he's familiar with Comrade Blyton, uh, born in the Caribbean, who winds up being a leader of uh, Liberia in the early 20th century, one of the most significant uh, black intellectuals and activists ever produced in the Pan-African world. In fact, in my book, Negro Comrades of the Crown, there's a poignant episode whereby Blighton finds himself in Washington, D.C. 
in Congress as they're debating the freedom or the abolition of slavery. It, it, it's something that really needs to be examined more carefully. So, you know, Carlos Cooks, you know, he, he has a point of view, but uh, I didn't know that he was a historian who dug deeply into history. Okay, uh, let me shut up and, and go back to your point, because I'll, I have so many things that, that, that I want to ask you, but that this is not the time. Well, I was going to mention the Olympics, which is the issue of the day, the issue of the moment. Uh, perhaps all of us can address this. I was riveted by the Cuban wrestler, Comrade Lopez, 6'5", 290 pounds, African descent, perhaps the most successful Olympian of all time, retiring from wrestling at the age of 41, 42, after five successful defenses. You had wrestlers who would not even get into the ring with him because they knew they were going to be defeated. And so in some ways, he, along with the boxers, who were mostly from Afri of African descent from Cuba, or a symbol not only of why there has been a persistence of the Cuban Revolution, but also symbols of the persistence of Afro descendants, as we are oftentimes called, the indomitable nature uh, of our struggle. I would also point naturally to the victory of the basketball team against France, although. Once again, Victor Wimignana of France has established himself as the face internationally of the game. He's, the, he's, he's really the future of basketball. Of course, I would salute the gymnasts. And I would also make the point that in terms of the medal hall, which is something that's paid attention to in the United States at least, one of the reasons why the United States has a substantial haul of gold, silver, and bronze medals is because of the women. And that has a lot to do with the change in the law in the early 1970s, Title IX as it's called, which mandated more expenditures on athletics and sports for women, which was not only important for sports, but it's also important sociologically because we all know that sports leads to bonding, sports leads to competitiveness, which has spinoffs in terms of academia, business life, et cetera. And so one of the main reasons why the medal hall for the U.S. is so significant is because of the women. And let's start with the gymnasts led by the self-proclaimed goat. <laughs> That's what she calls herself, the greatest of all time with some justification, speaking of Simone Biles of Southeast Texas. And uh, I would also point to the women's basketball team, which has not lost a match since 1992 and <laughs> did quite well once again in terms of the Olympics. So back to you. And then, it, of course, if you want to add uh, any added comment about Carlos Cooks, feel free. In terms of uh, the, the boxing, I, I I can't never forget uh, Theophilio Stevens, uh, who was a, a heavyweight champion from Cuba, Olympic champion. And they wanted him to box Muhammad Ali, and he refused, saying that you know that's that's when they had the uh, uh, the cultural boycott of, of, of South Africa. They wanted, I think it was might it might have may have even been Don King offered to put together a fight between Theophilio Stevenson, Stevenson and Muhammad Ali. And Theophilio Stevenson's roots are from St. Vincent and, and the Grenadines. And I think he was a formidable uh, boxer. Uh, uh, and uh, I think, I think the, the, the Theophilio recently passed away in the last year or so. Oh, that's news to me. I think he did pass away. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think the, 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 the Ophelia uh, did, 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 did pass away. And in terms of the, 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 the Carlos Cooks, uh, Carlos Cooks, I, I have 
a lot of respect for Carlos Cooks. However, his anti-communism always bothered me, bothered me terribly, because we have we started an organization in in Toronto called the Afro-American Progressive Association, and a lot of the Caribbean people were upset at us because they said you guys are coming here with you know with some Yankee Doodle Dandy imperialism, and we would always laugh and say. Afro American, we got that from Carlos Cooks. You know, he was the one that that term used the term Af- Afro American and African American, and uh, we had a. Uh, but Carlos Cooks, I know, and you can attest to this. Uh, uh, they used to go after, uh, fight with the members of the Communist Party. I know you have some stories about that. Oh yeah, but back to Blighton. Um... He's going to appear in my book on North Africa, which will take a few more years to produce, because he visited Egypt and had some very interesting stories to tell about Egypt and, in fact, about the graffiti (laughs) that he espied on the Sphinx, for example. Uh, He's an absolutely fascinating character. The Trinidadian, late Trinidadian scholar Hollis Lynch has written about him. And of course, a descendant of Mr. Blyton now teaches at the University of Virginia, and she's a leading scholar of Pan-Africanism. It's quite a lineage. Well, the uh, brother that used to listen to this show, Edwin Wilson, uh, knew that sister. And Edward Wilmot Blyton was an expert on Islam. I don't know, did, did he convert to Islam? I believe he did. And he was yeah. a critic of Christianity. I mean, I, I, I think that to zoom out for a second, many black people in terms of the struggles we endured in this hemisphere, we we're looking for allies. And of course, many look to allies, to the socialist camp, to Boys, Robeson, etc. Others like Blyton look to allies from the Islamic camp. And uh, I'm not, I don't recall if Lynch, who I mentioned, who actually was at Columbia University when I was a student there, stresses that sufficiently. Uh, that's one of my favorite. I, 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 I used to read everything, if the, his book, and if there was an article, article by him, was he, was, was he in Buffalo for a second as well? As, 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 was, was he in Buffalo for a brief moment? I believe so. Hollis Lynch. Hollis Lynch, yeah. Was he a Caribbean brother or was he on the United Trinidad States? Trinidad Tobago. Yeah. Hollis Lynch. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I, uh, I, 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 I studied him religiously at one point. Uh, can we go on and talk about uh, the VP? Uh, uh, soon to be, it looks like uh, Miss Miss uh, Kamala Harris is making a a, a, a lot of news, and and uh, I wanted to talk about her and the fact that she's estranged from her Marxist father. Could you talk about that? Yeah, it's, it's you know I'm always saddened to hear those sorts of stories between a father and a daughter. Of course, Donald Harris is an esteemed left winger, formerly residing in the San Francisco Bay Area, where he meets a woman who is Kamala Harris's mother. He was in the economics department at Stanford University. He's now, I think, 85 years old, still in the land of the living, still residing in Jamaica. Uh, We'll see if there will be a reconciliation between the two, although it does not look to be in the offing. But with regard to the polls right now, to the extent that you credit these polls, she's surging ahead of her chief opponent, speaking of Donald J. Trump. I say your chief opponent because there are those such as myself, and of course I vote in the state of Texas, and we all know about the U.S. presidential races where You can get the most votes and still lose. And a U.S. presidential race is 50 plus 
racist. And in the state of Texas, uh, I'm supporting Cornel West and his running mate, Alina Abdullah from Los Angeles. But having said that, uh, the polls, to the extent that you credit them, are suggesting that she's surging ahead. And Mr. Trump is a bit discombobulated by this new opponent. Recall that he claimed that she only turned, quote, black, unquote, of late, which is apparently false. I mean, after all, she did attend Howard University, a historically black college in Washington. She pledged a black American sorority, speaking of Alpha Kappa Alpha. So Mr. Trump, I guess he's having trouble coming up with a line of attack against Vice President Harris, which is leading to a stumble in the polls. But there is still a lot of time between now and the first Tuesday in November. And anybody who underestimates the strength of reactionary politics amongst the descendants of European settlers in North America are making a fundamentally profound mistake. Uh, I, I I think I tend to agree, but I just want to sidetrack track you again and say that Donald Harris was born and was raised in uh, St. Anne's Parish in Jamaica, which is the uh, same spot as Robert Nestor Marley and uh, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. So, uh, and, and the point I want to make was he was also a part of the a group that was started by Donald Warden, who, who became a Muslim, I forgot his name, an international lawyer, but Donald Warden's group included Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, Ron Karinga, uh, Kenny Freeman, uh, Mamadou Lumumba, uh, and many others on, on the West Coast, yeah. That comes up and in I my part- book, in fact. I have some nuggets to add about that, uh, particularly regarding the influence of Saudi Arabia and Pakistan on mm-hmm. black Americans okay. who became Muslims. I find yes, it to be an intriguing story that needs further exploration. Uh, yes, sir. Um, but I think, I'm going to say this and we can move on, but the, uh, 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 the Nation of Islam used the... Uh, the the Quran that they used was 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 the Ahmadiyya's uh, Quran. They didn't use the, uh, the 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 Quran that most of the Sunni Muslims use. They they used the uh, Maulana Maulana uh, Ali. I think was it was was I it used to have that Quran, but it was uh, the Ahmadiyya's used it. And I know I was in a taxi one time, and I mentioned uh, the Quran by the. Uh, the uh, Ahmadiyya Muslim, and he almost wanted to put him out of the taxi, but he wanted to get his fare, so he let me stay, but uh, he was quite upset about that. Mm. Well, as you know, Ahmadiyya, many Muslims in Pakistan, shall we say, are, are not friendly <laughs> towards the right. trend. <laughs> although it sunk roots here in North America, not least because at the end of the 19th century, you had a migration uh, from British India to the United States. And as so often happens, and it still happens to this very day, uh, migrants settle in Black American communities. And That's according right. to some, that helps to lead to the formation of the nation of Islam about uh, 90 odd years ago. Well, the only, only Muslims I knew growing up were the Nation of Islam and the Ahmadiyyas. I didn't know. I, I didn't know what a Sunni or a Sufi or a, or a, a, a Shia was at that particular time. All I knew was Temple Twenty Seven on you know in in, in Los Angeles and the Ahmadiyyas. I don't know. I, I never went to their meeting place, but they were all over Los Angeles, California. Okay. So Melinda, you have some questions. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Um. So um. Let's let's touch on, like, we didn't touch on, like, the U.S., Japan ties tightening, and what's going on in Sahel? Well, with regard to the former, um, 
it's the U.S. Japan ties tightening as part of this new Cold War against China. In fact, uh, pay attention to this new neoconservative book entitled bluntly, We Win, You Lose. That's how the neoconservatives are approaching the People's Republic of China, you being yes, China. And uh, the United States might live to regret this remilitarization of Japan in that context. I guess there's not a historical memory of the combativeness and the fighting metal of the Japanese military. In fact, I've argued, uh, it's in my book, Race War, that one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why the United States dropped atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th, August 9th, 1945, was because they, they were having a hell of a time confronting the Japanese military in the battlefield. And this was almost like a last gasp to try to subdue Tokyo. And obviously it worked <laughs> because Japan surrendered after that horrendous episode of mass murder, tens of thousands incinerated instantaneously, August 6th, August 9th, 1945. We'll mark the 80th anniversary next year. Interestingly enough, Rahm Emanuel, the former mayor of Chicago, present U.S. ambassador to China, he refused, along with some of his uh, Western European peers, to participate in the ceremony marking the 79th anniversary just a day or two ago in Nagasaki, because apparently there was some sort of attempt to circumscribe the potential of the Israeli emissary. And of course, the settlers' regimes tend to stand together, oftentimes backed by their European comrades. And so Rahm Emanuel did not show up to the dismay of many in Japan. You're listening to Diasport Music on uh, Black Power 96. More questions, Melinda? Yes, so um, let's go to Bangladesh. Well, as you know, the leader uh, has been chased out just a few days ago. Bangladesh, a nation of 170 plus million on the eastern border of India, once part of Pakistan, but about a half century ago, it seceded from Pakistan because of assistance from India and also because of complaints about oppression from Pakistan, then West Pakistan. That was a major international development because India and the Soviet Union supported the secession of Bangladesh. China and Pakistan did not. Interestingly enough, as I say in the book, the Black Panther Party sided with China and Pakistan, and that did not necessarily win them plaudits in India, in Moscow, nor in Cuba, which should have been a top priority diplomatically since Cuba tended to stand on the side of the then Soviet Union. And in, in any case, the leadership was chased out because there was a complaint and a protest about quotas, particularly for employment, uh, reservations as they're called in India. Affirmative action would be the term we use here in the United States. Positive discrimination might be the term used in London. And the positive discrimination in Bangladesh tended to benefit the families of those who fought in the liberation war that drove protesters into the streets. And they drove out the leader uh, who is now in India. Uh, U.S. imperialism thinks it can benefit from this. I was dismayed to read about some of the protesters harassing the Hindu minority. Uh, in Bangladesh, which is a reflection of the Islamophobia of New Delhi, Prime Minister Modi, and I guess the protesters feel that it's payback to 
with the Hindu minority uh, being the loser in that regard. Uh, also pay attention to events in neighboring Myanmar or Burma, where the rebels, many of whom are backed by the United States, are on the march. Burma borders the People's Republic of China, one of 14 nations bordering China. The United States feels that if it can weaken the military regime in Myanmar, it can have a base on the southern border of China. Recall that perhaps the last country visited by then U.S. President Barack Obama in November 2016 was precisely Myanmar, for example. So we're going to have to pay attention, close attention to developments there. Um, we have only have a few minutes left, but I definitely wanted to ask you about the unrest in Nigeria as well as Kenya. Well, both are driven by a protest about socioeconomic conditions, magnified in Kenya, East Africa, because of the fact that the regime was trying to raise taxes to pay off international creditors including taxes on women's sanitary products, including taxes on diapers and nappies. That drove people into the streets. President Ruto has fired a good deal of his cabinet. The protests continue nonetheless. The protests continue for similar reasons in Nigeria, on the other side of the continent. Uh, Nigeria, of course, was in the news because some of the protesters were carrying Russian flags. Now, I interpret that as a symbol of the protesters feeling that the regime of President Tanubu is backed by the North Atlantic countries. They see Russia as the opponent of the North Atlantic countries, and so therefore they raise the Russian flag. Likewise, Russia has been embraced by the Sahel states, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali which are not necessarily in the good graces of Nigeria. Recall the conflict within the economic community of West African states that caused the Sahel states to abandon ECOWAS. So this is a very serious turn of events in Nigeria. And in the next few weeks, I'll be interviewing on KPFK kpfk.org, and of course to be ultimately deposited on the Activist News Network, a writer who's written a book on what's been called the Civil War in Nigeria in the late 1960s involving Biafra, as it was then called, and he focuses on the role of black Americans during that so-called Biafran conflict. And I must say, I'm looking forward to exchanging ideas on that topic. Well, definitely be, be interested in that. I think there's a lot of, uh, and there was a big debate in, 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 I guess, debate all around the world as to uh, Biafra and uh, what, whether or not Biafra had the right to uh, to self-determination. I guess at that time, everybody was, or well, the Pan-Africanism was, people were talking about, I guess, uniting Africa, as well as the Caribbean and Africans in America, and, you know, becoming, uh, Nkrumah talked about having one African state, then I guess there were other people who were talking about having, like Nyeri that was talking about East African unity, and then eventually coming to African unity. So I guess that's going to be, your research is going to be based around that issue, I know, yeah. And in the meantime, tune in to kpfk.org on Saturday, 11 a.m. Pacific, for our next program, which will have a segment on Robert F. Williams, formerly of North Carolina and Detroit, in exile in both Cuba and China. Stay tuned. And he lived, or he was in... He was